Good morning. Welcome to Fort Laramie Country Church. We're glad you're with us this morning. Today it's a topic I really enjoy talking about because I've, I've seen and felt the reality in my life. And it's how to have real change. Before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Fathers, we look into your word right now. Help us grasp what you're trying to show us and teach us. Help us grasp the reality of this. Father, most of all, that it changes us and moves us in a direction closer to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, most people want to be a better person or a more godly person. We want to get rid of those sinful tendencies and the stress and fear in our life. And even the negative attitudes we, we seem to get with everything that's going on in the world right now. We want to get control of our lives. I, 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 you'd almost ask everybody that question and that would, yeah, and I want my life in order. So how do we do that? How does that happen? What's the reality of that? Well, the logical thing to do or what the world even teaches is, is uh, to find a set of principles and rules to live by. And by doing that, you'll have change in your life. And that's why people always have New Year's resolutions. This year, it's going to be different. I'm going to change this and this and this in my life. Or that's what self-help books are all about. You know, if I read this book and do these principles and rules, I'll have a better life. I'll, I'll, you know, and, and if I can keep those rules and all those principles, everything will fall in place. You know, and that's kind of what. But if you do that, I guarantee all you're going to do is become frustrated. See, because principles and rules never changed anybody. Because uh, the change is the wrong direction. We are trying to change from things from the outside in. Uh, real change only happens from the inside out. And you know that. I had a friend, and I think we were probably a senior in high school when he got this car. He had a little 68 Camaro. And back then, they put six cylinders in a few of them. And, and they weren't six cylinders like they are today, pretty high horsepower and everything. They were just a straight six cylinder, an inline six. Not a lot of power, not a lot of get up and go at all. And in fact, they were pretty doggy. And so he got this car and he's going to fix it up. And so the first thing he did was did all the body work. I mean, he they was pretty on the outside. Tended out to be kind of a, a canary yellow with the metal flake, yeah, chrome wheels, wide tires on the back, narrow on the front, just pretty classic of the times. And it was a beautiful car. It was a beautiful car to look at. He did a did a great job, but to drive that car, it was still a dog. It absolutely had no power. He really should have put that time and money and energy on changing the power plant. It needed a new engine. See, the change needed to be on the inside, not on the outside, to really make that car better. That car needed a new engine. And Jesus never tried to change anybody from the outside in. He didn't do it. Galatians 2.20 is our text today. You're very familiar with it, or if, if you've never seen it before, this should be very exciting for you. I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, it says, I've been crucified with Christ. In order for Christ to live in me, we need to remove, I need to remove me as the center of my life. <clears throat> I need to virtually make room for Jesus. It says crucified. That means there's been a death. This is where we die to self. You know, in order for that Camaro, that little 68 Camaro we just talked about, uh, to get a, a new power plant, it needed to get rid of the old one. If somebody was going to put a new engine in that, they needed to go take the old one out. They needed to make room for that new engine. You couldn't put both engines there. It didn't work. They wouldn't function together. It, that just can't happen. That's impossible. The same thing here. We can't have Christ living in us and, uh, and us living in us because it's just not how it works. We have to die to self so Christ can be that new power plant. Uh, it says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. I am the old power source. It's the 
I no longer live who craves self-reliance and self-confidence and self-direction and self-expression. That must die. In fact, Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupt by deceitful desires, to be made new in attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That's what he says. The former way of life, the old Marty has to be taken out so the, the so God and Jesus Christ can be put in. You know, uh, the new eye always looks at self and trusts self, where the new power plant is putting my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But Jesus... Then he says, but Jesus lives in me. He's our new source of power. Um, he's, he, he meant to, Jesus transforms us from the inside out. That new V8 would transform that car from the inside out. And it's Christ lives in you. You know, it, it doesn't say he's dead in you. It doesn't say he's silent in you. It doesn't say he's powerless in you. He says he's alive in you. You know, uh, he has things he wants to do through you. He has he has a, a new attitude and new qualities he wants to express through you, alive in you. Uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 4. For to be sure, he, this is Jesus, was crucified in weakness, yet lived by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet... By God's power, we will be alive with Him to serve Him. Alive in you. He brings life. He brings a source of life. He brings that new power source from the inside out. And these are some changes that comes with this. It says, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. You know, I live by faith in the Son of God. When we do that, we start living with identity. A lot of people struggle with identity when they get up and look in the mirror in the morning. They go, who am I? They wonder who they are. They struggle. I haven't heard this for a while, but uh, when we were growing up, people were go find themselves. You know, we had to go find ourselves. And, and that's because they're looking for their identity. They don't know who they are. And in all reality, we're just onions. And if you've ever peeled as you get in and start to find yourself, as you start peeling away onion, there's nothing but onion. You can get all the way to the middle, it's still onion. Uh, th there's nothing but onion, and that's how we are. If you replace that onion with Jesus, there's more to life than us. There's more to life than being an onion. Our identity. Our identity becomes clear. When you get up in the morning and start that engine, you're going to know who you are. Look how Paul states who he is in the in in the church of Romans. This is how he opens up his letter to the book of Romans. Paul, listen, look at it. He knows who he is. He knows his identity. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. Paul was clear on his identity because Christ lived in him. He starts his letter with an identity. We usually end with who we are. He started with who he was. Tozer said it this way. This is how he defined faith. As the gaze of your soul upon a saving God is the gaze of your heart upon a saving Christ. It is giving him full attention of your heart and the complete trust of your heart. This looking of the heart to Jesus can be done by any person, at any moment, in any place. It does not require worship music or church service or even quiet time. In fact, it must be practiced when your boss gives you an unreasonable assignment or your kids are fighting or your spouse provokes you. These are the very times we live by faith in the Son of God. Another change that happens, it's, it's like when we have Christ living in us, it's living in relationship with Jesus. We've got a man in our church, his name's Terry. He used to do dirt track racing in California. And, uh, and he was good at it. And as we talked, and it was fun to talk to him, he said when he first got the car, he was afraid of it. He was scared of it. And then when somebody started first turning the 
first bolts on his car. He almost panicked, you know, and he didn't understand his car. But, he's, but as he went on to actually be a very good driver, he started to understand balance and ballast and and, and there was a lot of ratios and how the car ran and how it was built. Pretty soon he said he could tear it apart and put it together in a day. Excuse me. <coughs> put it together in a day. He actually became part of that car. He, he, he lived in relationship with that car. John 6, 57. Just as I, just as the living God sent me. This is Jesus. I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. Feeding on Jesus is, 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 is living in relationship with Him. Wherever we go, whatever we do, whoever we meet, we always function in relationship with Jesus Christ. Luther said it this way, Faith connects us so intimately with Christ that He and you become it as we're one person. As you may boldly say, I am now one with Christ. Therefore, Christ's righteousness, victory, and life are mine. Relationship. That comes in living relationship when Christ lives in us. Another thing that happens when Christ lives in us, we start living with direction. You know, when you wake up in the morning, you're going to know your direction. Uh, it, I like to know where I'm headed. I'm a guy that even, I know I've got a GPS even when I hunt, but I still like to look at maps and know the terrain of the country and how it lays out and what it looks like. I like to know the direction I'm headed. When we travel cross country, I still get out a map most of the time ahead of time, and I want to look because I want to understand the direction we're headed. <clears throat> and here's the direction. Jesus in Matthew 16, 24 said, Jesus said to his disciples, if if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. That's the dying we talked about. And take up his cross and follow me. When you follow Jesus, you will always be headed in the right direction. In the gospel I found following Jesus, in all four gospels, following Jesus is mentioned 21 times. We don't have to stop and ask for directions. Jesus is our direction. You know, when, when that happens... And, and Christ starts living in you and you live in that relationship and you have an identity and you have purpose, you, you have a direction. That's exciting. And, and, and you're going to want to share that message. You're going to, you, because Jesus virtually becomes our story. I can remember my first muscle car. I was a senior in high school, uh, probably towards the middle of the year there, and I saved up some money and, and bought a 1970 Mercury Cyclone GT. And it had a 429 Cobra jet in it. I'm telling you what, it, it, it was exciting to drive. You know what the first thing I did? I went and I took it and showed it to my friends because I was excited. First thing we did was we popped up the hood to look at the power source. What causes this car to act this way? Why is it this way? It's got, look at this power source. I wanted to show it. I wanted to share it. Hop in. I want to show you. Well, I want to show you something. I want to share, share with you this 429 Cobra Jet. It's exciting. And that's how it is when Christ. We have a message to share. We should be excited about it. You know, can you think about this? What if somebody came up with a cure for every cancer we have? Virtually figured out the cure for every cancer we had. And they go, I'm not going to share it. I'm not going to tell you how to get it. I'm not telling you where to get it. I don't want anybody else to have it. What would you think of that person? We have an exciting message to share. How your, your sins can be forgiven. How you know you can have eternal life. How you can have real change in your life. How you can have life and have it to the full or more abundantly in John 10.10. You know, we have a message to share and we have a responsibility to share it. Maybe you're sitting here listening to this today and you've never experienced true change. You've never felt true forgiveness. You don't know if you have eternal life. You can. 
His name is Jesus Christ. And that's where it all starts. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When he died on the cross, he gave himself for you. And when we live by faith, that starts by faith. We're saved by faith through grace. And what that means is there comes a point you have to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You have to ask him to come into your life and forgive every sin you've ever done. And he does that. All you have to do is ask. Right where you are today, you can do that. It's simple. It's easy. After this message, there's going to be a phone number. And if you have more questions, please call. I would love to visit with you about that. I would love to share more with you about what Christ has for you and how your life can have purpose and meaning. Let us pray. Father, if there's anybody out there right now that has not put their faith and trust in you, and they've heard this, and they know God is pulling them to him, or her, we're going to ask that, Father, they give their life to you right now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.